Hi everyone, my name is Edlin. I'm from the EduTech team and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Today we'll have a webinar session all focusing on future-proof EdTech strategies from continuity to resilience and robustness. Today's session is hosted in collaboration with NACE. If you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box you see at the bottom of your screen. Right now, we'll have our moderator, Gavin Hawkins, chair of NACE. He'll be introducing himself as well as introducing, to, introducing you to the rest of our panel. Gavin, please. Uh, thanks, Edlin. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you. And hello, everyone. I'm Gavin Hawkins, and uh, I'm the chair of NACE. Um, NACE is the UK EdTech Association, and we support practitioners in schools, colleges, universities, uh, to embed ed tech across the curriculum. Uh, we're a membership organization and we're the owners of the self-review framework. Uh, that's a maturity model for ed tech adoption in schools. Uh, and I noticed from the particip participant list, actually a number of colleagues uh, are, are known to us and are NACE members, which is great to see. Um, in addition to the self-review framework, we've actually got a, um, an accreditation scheme as well called the NACE mark. Um, and that accredits schools and assesses schools against the framework um, and rewards schools that are embedding te ed technology across the curriculum in innovative and, uh, and, and interesting ways. Um, to date, we have about 16,000 schools that have used the SRF uh, and an increasing number of schools that are going through the, the NACEMARC process. Uh, in addition to my role as, as chair of NACE, uh, my day job is, is as an ed tech consultant. Um, I'm a former teacher, um, senior leader in school, um, local authority advisor, all of those sorts of things. Um, I'm conscious it, it's probably my job to introduce everybody else, but I think it would be better if the other panellists introduce themselves, because you'll be able to speak far more eloquently about yourself than I will. Um, so if we can do if we can do that first, please, and I can just do that on my screen in the order that I've got people on the screen, if that's okay. Uh, Sarah, are you happy to go first? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Morgan. I'm assistant head teacher at Feasy Park Farm Primary School, which is based in the Midlands of, of the UK. Um, I am currently my role is to support schools through the EdTech Demonstrator Program, which is a Department for Education funded program um, for, from the English government. Um, and that is to su support schools, give peer to peer support um, for, from our school to other schools in their um, education technology journey, uh, wherever they are um, with that journey and we, and we support them the best they, they can. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Wolfgang? Yeah, good, uh, good afternoon or good morning or, or evening, depending where you're tuning in. My name is Wolfgang Soldner. I'm uh, currently working at the International School of Geneva as one of their ICT campus partners at the La Chateaneré campus. Um, I've been on the road really internationally since I've been 11. As you can tell by the name, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm German, but by the accent, you might think I'm South African, English, whatever it may be that I'm uh, currently sort of sounding like. Um, but predominantly having worked in international schools and for the last, um, I guess, 12 years or so in ed tech in various roles as uh, coach, coordinator, tech director, and now overlooking the campus-wide uh, ICT, both in terms of technical side, but ed tech as well um, at my current school. Thanks Wolfgang, and Jose? Yeah, hi, I'm Jose. I'm the technical director at the Limona International School in, in the southeast of Spain. Uh, but I also work as a, as a teacher turning tutor at the uh, online at the University Isabel I in, in, in Spain. Plus, uh, I'm a legacy performance coach online as well for VPN, which is based in the UK, uh, do, helping, you know, uh, uh, teachers or deputy head teachers, people who want to become head, head uh, heads in the UK. So I'm part of the MPQH program in that. So that's it, really. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so my 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 role here is is to moderate the discussion, um, and we do want to have a discussion, and we don't particularly just want you to listen to us. We'd like you to contribute as well. So if you could use the QA 
um, box, please, for any questions, and we'll pick that, those up as we go. Um, and uh, we have some questions that we'll 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 start to, to talk work our way through. Um, but we are very keen to hear from from colleagues uh, as well. Um, so to start with, then um, I think uh, we'll start with a question um, that that we we've, we've been considering. I guess most of us in our in our various roles. So. Due to the pandemic, most education leaders realised the true potential of technology. What strategies should now be pursued to sustain those goals? So this is around this is around sustainability, I guess, and the the the, the uh, rewards that we gained as a result of of uh, the pandemic and the gains that were made. I'm going to start off, and, and it's not my intention to comment on every question either, but I think I'll, I'll just make a start because um, I'm going to link this directly to the self-review framework, which is the NACE tool. And I guess that's probably why I'm here. So I'll just I'll just lead into that. So, so the self-review framework has six elements. And I think this is probably important when we're considering this question around sustainability. Um, and those six elements are specifically around leadership management, teaching and learning, assessment, resources, professional development, and, uh, and digital safeguarding. And I think as leaders, probably what we need to do is to be considering all of those various aspects. What I'm finding in my day job is that schools are probably getting hung up on one or two of those, particularly around resources, because schools suddenly find themselves quite, quite equipment rich, but might be quite curriculum poor. And with, in that, I mean that we've flooded schools with equipment because we needed to. But have we considered the implications of that now that schools have returned in most cases? So uh, are we considering the impact that the quality professional development will have? Are we considering real contextual opportunities for teaching and learning? And some of those things may be being lost purely because we're trying to fill gaps, which is completely understandable. But as we as we move on from COVID recovery and recovery curriculum, which is certainly happening here in the UK, are we thinking about ways in which we can extend those curriculum opportunities to make absolutely sure that we've got we've got real context uh, and also as, as leaders, are we thinking about what our long term aims might be? We've dealt with something. We've we've schools have had to had to deal with an emergency. But are we now considering how three or five years we might be considering what that action plan might look like? So, uh, panel uh, Wolfgang, would you like to, to to contribute to that? Yeah, for sure, Gavin. I think um, first of all, I think you hit the nail on the head, and especially when coming from the point of talking of curriculum and pedagogy first, rather than the technology side. Um, I think the last two years and ongoing in certain parts of the world, for sure, um, still the, the, the the sort of virtual or online teaching environment have shown that that um, you know we we weren't ready as a as a whole um, in terms of education. I think that stems, you know, talking about strategy. I think a lot of it stems from um, teacher training still not really incorporating the the best practice models of ed tech and and how that can be translated into teaching and learning and what that looks like. Um, but then within schools, you know, with with the demographics that we have to that we have, um, I think a lot of schools have failed to recognize that that sort of um, space to to really build that continued professional develop, development as you said and i know later on i think um, we're definitely going to be talking about that more in depth but um having been in international schools they've invested in that for for a while already but even there i would say that one, once the pandemic hit it was more a sort of quickly firefighting scenario where we we sort of just look towards a bunch of these companies that really offered their services for free very, very quickly. And it became very difficult to navigate through that jungle of availability because it was free for the time being and really narrow down to what actually the pedagogical goals and outcomes should be. And so, you know, we're using Zoom here being one of them. I mean, it was fantastic for them to react and, and, and help schools, especially in education and trying to um, find ways even for, for students in, in maybe more rural countries and 
and, and parts of countries, um, even developed countries where maybe internet and stability wasn't that great. But ultimately, I think um, a lot of it wasn't strategically thought through. And, and so now we, we're at a point where I don't think anybody could argue against the fact that it, this, this whole pandemic, the online teaching world and, and the asynchronous and synchronous bits that we try to um, implement really benefited some students that in a conventional setting um, potentially were left behind or, or, or couldn't really join in the same way. Whereas of course for others, it had the opposite effect. Um, and so I think we're at a point now where we really need to look towards figuring out which parts were the ones that were strategically and pedagogically sound and actually um, in, enhanced and increased teaching and learning, and which parts were just reactionary to try and cover our bases to, to continue that, that learning, um, um, yeah, the learning journey. So I think that's more or less where we're at at the moment um, to see, to see where we, how we can sort out that mess. Thanks, Wolf. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, interestingly, I just jotted down the word reflect because I think just listening to both of you, I think schools are at a point now where they, they should maybe reflect on what's happened over the last two years. Um, and during that reflection, as Wolfgang mentioned, pull out the things that really worked, what did have those positive gains, S might be really small gains, but positive gains. Look at how the technology supported that. And use the time because time is something which we, which we do have where maybe mm -hmm. during the last two years, we didn't have so much, everything was thrown at us all at once. Um, so have, have, have some time to create a really clear vision on where you as your school want to go to um, and to create that vision I think it's important that you have all stakeholders involved as well so, so it is from the from the from the leadership team as well as the, the ed tech driver within the school and the parents and the children and the wider community and um, because then I think you've you've really kind of got that culture um, because I think it is a culture change and is change management that needs to take place within a school to make something sustainable. Um, so I think schools just need to take that reflection moment right now and really think about what their next steps are going to be and the journey that they'd like to go on. Um, keeping ed tech development as a journey and not a destination, I think that helps because we just, it's going to be ongoing because we don't know what's going to come next. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Jose? There you go. Um, yeah, I mean, go, going back to kind of from the very beginning to what Gavin was saying, then Wolverine, and then Sarah as well. I think it was thinking in terms of, you know, obviously the, the pandemic, what, what it did to schools, I think it was great. Uh, I mean, for, you know, let aside all of the, the you know, the, the sad stories that were behind it. Uh, but in terms of technology and in terms of education, most of all, I think we jumped forward, like, you know, like fast forward five, 10 years, I don't know exactly how many, uh, because, we, uh, uh, you know, institutions were pushed really into technology because parents demanded it, because the students needed it, and because we felt that we needed to provide that to students and families as well uh, to help them and, and you know, uh, move forward in the in the under the situation that we were in. Now, I think it's coming to a point now where people are going back to that comfort zone where okay it's fine and we're not using technology i mean it's not using technology for the sake of using technology as you some of you have just said i think it's more if you if we envision everything like you know educational needs uh, pedagogical and everything else you know being like a planet you know we're in, in a galaxy and then we're surrounded by satellites and those satellites for me would be you know something that Gavin was already pointing out uh, the strategic vision uh, the obviously the budgets and the investments and 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 the short and low and medium and long term uh, plans as well because obviously we through the pandemic everything was like a rush and and after a couple of months that uh, people started to settle in people you know staff who didn't really have to send a, a, an attachment with an email where you know delivering lessons through Zoom or any other you know platform uh, really quickly so we've proved ourselves and institutions that we can use technology for the benefit of education, not the other way around. And obviously, and I agree with something that's been said as well, you know, the, the stakeholders need to do an analysis and then everything, you know, those satellites go around education and then hopefully we'll carry on moving forward. 
Thanks, Jose. I, I, I do like the um, the satellite uh, analogy. Um, I have an awful feeling that I've, I've just I've, I've drawn what I think the self review framework might look like as, as satellites moving around. I, I, this may be a complete mistake, but um, the board of management are going to hate me when we get when we next meet. Um, well, interestingly, I, 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 a number I draw, of I draw the galaxy as well myself. <laughs> <laughs> we'll use your drawing. Um, interestingly, and so so we all probably picked up there how important it is that that around ensuring those those key stakeholders are involved and i guess i guess the some of those key stakeholders are absolutely the the teachers in classrooms because um it was it was them that we were asking the the really tough questions of how how do you transition to this remote learning model when really for the vast majority of us it was something that we were you know we, we we'd absolutely aspired to do because we felt that that was a model that, that absolutely could, could support learning. But to move into such a way that we did so quickly, uh, without any professional development really, other than firefighting, which, is, which, is, which tended to happen in, in lots, of, lots of places, I just wonder now, moving on, I guess, to, to professional development then, because this is absolutely linked, I think, uh, how do we ensure the consistency equity and quality of, of professional development. And I want to add in a word as well, that, that word that is often missed within CPD, the continuing bit, the continuous nature of professional development, rather than things just happening as a one-off and we assume that staff have learned it. How do we ensure the consistency, equity and quality of continuous professional development? Um, Sarah, do you want to kick us off? Because I'm conscious that much of your world for the last two years has been around professional development. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I think it's absolutely key um, for what we're talking about now. And I think the continuous word, um, teachers in the classrooms, incredibly busy, roles across schools, everyone's, you know, short of time all the time. But I think to get anything, anything working, anything to get anything off the ground and to make that absolute impact, we owe it to the teachers to give them that quality <clears throat> professional development. So they've got they've got confidence in what they are being asked to use, how they are asked to, de to deliver. Um, I, I think any program or in any support that, that schools are looking to get, if it could be linked to, to, to maybe a peer-to-peer -peer approach or somebody who's actually doing it themselves, so, so they can really tell you what it's like, warts and all, you know, the, the, the things that, that don't work as well, as well as the things that do work as well. Um, I think it really helps schools um, because it saves them time trying to make, you know, make, make, stop them making mistakes themselves and people have already ironed it out. So I think I think reach out for colleagues and schools who are maybe just a little bit further along their ed tech journey than what you are um, and, and see if you can work together with them. Because the peer to peer approach, teacher to teacher, head to head, I think it's a really powerful way of working. Also, um, when looking to make investments in, in technology, really think carefully about who you're going to be working with, which, which industry partners and um, is it? somebody who's just going to throw a load of kit at you and walk away or is it going to be a company who really understands um, teaching and learning understands learning um, and and provides continuous updates continuous training and opportunities for staff to improve themselves self-improve is that okay as a starting point absolutely thanks sarah um jose yeah yeah, yeah, I was I was about to turn the mic on before. <laughs> Actually, I mean, I completely agree with what Sarah was saying on, and, and you know, taking that a little bit further as well. I think looking into the the different um, levels or, or experience that staff have in, in inside an institution, really. I mean, you're seeking for those people and maybe creating some kind of uh, transformation or digital transformation team, even before you know, reaching out to some company, finding out first or analyzing a little bit, I mean, looking inside, what is it that we've got? Uh, what is it that we want? And then, you know, create, uh, you know, even through the professional development, the professional reviews and everything else, maybe even creating, I don't know, like a general objective for everyone who could, 
be adapted to their, you know, whatever the stage or the, the subject they're teaching, but well, maybe trying to put that little brain of, you know, technology, include that technology, so that that's reviewed and, and that's included across the whole institution, really. That's my view, <laughs> anyway. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Wolf, Wolfgang? Yeah, um, I, I, actually picking up on Jose's point, point um, just then and, and, and Sarah, Sarah's earlier point, I think that's a, a nice combination to look at professional learning communities and link them somewhat with appraisal. And I remember years ago, a principal of mine um, actually addressing the whole staff of the school um, when, when there was a bit of kerfuffle and, and, and uproar against the new appraisal system saying that he... As a, as a senior leader actually believed that it should be us as staff asking for appraisal because it was our right to be appraised. And if, if you actually change that mentality to, to not look at the negative sides of appraisal, which is, you know, to most teachers that sort of, you're gonna pick on me and, 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 and you know, point out my flaws potentially leading towards that, that, that fear of, of potentially getting fired or reprimanded and look at it more towards, here is somebody who's got the time and expertise to look at what I'm doing and give me advice as to where I, I, I can find better professional development in areas where maybe I need some, some development, then I think we could tie in things like EdTech. And I think then, then Jose's point of really looking towards standards for teachers and, and looking at what does an excellent teacher look like and how do we build these, these rubrics and standards for teachers that we are very well versed in using for assessments. Um, and I don't mean in an assessing way, but more towards if you ask any student, they usually know exactly what a good teacher looks like inherently. Mm -hmm. Um, same for us as, as, as colleagues. I think we know who, who are really good colleagues, and I don't mean this in that there are bad colleagues, I just mean who are colleagues who demonstrate really good um, a, a sort of um, pathways and, and ways of teaching in certain areas that I think first and foremost, Sarah, like that PLC element, that internal, I know that you said towards looking towards others, and I would say absolutely, I think during the pandemic, that's been my lifeline, is, is working with others across the globe. Um, but even internally, there's so much good usually in schools that's being done and not being highlighted and, and, and starting with simple things, you know, show and tell and rewards and, and, and actually highlighting, spotlighting things that are being done well within the school, as small as they may seem, because for the most part, teachers are really humble. They never realize when they're actually doing something that's well worth it, and they just stick in their own little or to their own little um, world and in their shell. And so starting to really celebrate those things and, and looking at and then linking those to standards and appraisal. And that way, I think schools can, can move at, at lightning pace, I think, uh, because the expertise usually exists within the school. Um, and that linking that then with external factors, whether it be consultants coming in, companies who've got expertise in this, or just linking, you know, there, there are heads organizations, why not start linking their teachers with others and saying, here's a maths teacher who's doing something really great with online learning and tools, whereas here may be a group of teachers who really are new to this, so why not build an, a, a digital, just like we've done now, a digital classroom and environment for them to link up and, and work together. Thanks for that. And I think those those are really important aspects, aren't they? You know, professional learning communities, particularly, you know, those opportunities to to support each other, uh, you know, it, and, and having worked in other places as well, there, there there has been a culture of action research where we've we've taken opportunities and we've we've researched something and then had the opportunity to share that. Um, it, it's not it's not necessarily applicable in lots of places though it doesn't happen everywhere and certainly when i've worked in in uh, australia for example and um and and certainly areas of the middle east there's a, there's almost an expectation that that happens and yet we probably are missing a huge opportunity in lots of other places to to do that professional learning with each other and, and the sharing of that. Interestingly, I was at a conference yesterday where that was exactly what was what was happening, uh, an international conference. But and but it was it was almost it was almost extraordinary. It was not part of of, of a, 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 an, an accepted culture. And yet, absolutely, appraisal could be the driver for for that. So so do we think then, in terms of accreditation for for for, for teachers? I, I, you know, we, we're aware of ISTE standards, for example, UNESCO digital competencies frameworks, those sorts of things. 
do do the panelists do we know of other opportunities for either formal or informal accreditation i guess informal accreditation comes from those professional learning communities um, colleagues do we do we know of other places and other opportunities for that for that that sort of accreditation for teachers uh, who's who's keen to start uh, everybody <laughs> wolfgang sure um yeah so i mean that, that there's a whole bunch of different uh ways to to go about this right and 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 i will go back though to the to the strategic element of this because that is the underlying reason we're, we're talking about this is um for for too long i think we as teachers have been able to just go to conferences some of them have certifications towards the end or accreditation elements to them but to piece that together and really determine what it is that you as a school want um, is, I think, first and foremost, the, the, the important part of that conversation. Um, you know, whether you're a Google school or Microsoft school, they both offer fantastic certifications in the in the education world, the teaching world specifically. Google does a level one and a level two. Microsoft has a teacher certification. As you already mentioned, ISTE is more on the on the standards base, so across the, the mm -hmm. spectrum and the integration piece. Um, there is Common Sense Media that that works very hard and 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 is a, a an excellent resource for the for the digital citizenship element. Um, so across the board, and then there's organizations like 21st Century Learning that link just like you guys do with, with uh, ISTE um, in, in Southeast Asia and Asia more. Um, but, but again, I think coming back to that strategic place and, and really having that three to five year plan and saying, where do we want to be? What kind of standards do we want to work towards as a, as a faculty, as a teaching um, unit? and then picking those pieces and saying let's now accredit that so i can tell you now for example i've just assigned my my senior leadership team summer homework and they are all going to be working towards the google one and google two teacher certification because that that's the first starting point before we reach out to to our um, faculty members and say this is something that we believe is of value senior leadership needs to 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 lead by example and really show that that it, there's worth in it and and there really is and and whether you think you're already an expert or not i think going through a formalized certification course just gives you that that step and then linking that with what we said earlier sarah linking that with professional learning communities and cohorts and saying we're going to build within the school 10 15 teachers at a time that go through this and then they bring it into the classroom bring back actual real life examples of where it worked where it didn't work so well discussing that as a cohort and taking your time rather than just ticking that box of certification and i do want to make that point that i think too often times it's just ticking off that box rather than really looking at the sustainability and that continued professional development Jose? Yeah, I agree. I mean, well, when I, uh, apart from Google, we know Microsoft as well, you know, the, the, the MIA, MIA expert and this and that, and, the, and trainers as well. I mean, depending on the schools, depending on the hardware they use, I mean, obviously they will go to one or the other, even with, you know, uh, Apple or Macs or whatever it is. I think it's really important having, as, as you know, often was just saying, you know, having the, the school leaders to actually lead by example. I mean, there is no way a leader could know exactly what is it that they need. They haven't gone through the process and being able to, to say even, you know, the strengths and weaknesses and what it was harder for them. And then get support from other colleagues who, for example, are better at different things. I mean, that there's no one but anything, but they may have more experience than, than other people. And I think that accreditation, I think, and going back to a praise, and I was obviously as Wolfgang just did going back to what Sarah, I think it was Sarah saying about appraisal uh, earlier on. I think the appraisal needs teachers, or you know, teachers need to be aware that they they can get their own appraisal. If you know what I mean? It's, it's basically don't expect you know the head of whatever department or the head teacher or whoever it is, you know, to go back to you and say you know well done you know you're doing well once you see your students are happy and they're engaged and they're you know students who usually won't participate in the lesson they're participating and really doing really really well you know and showing off for in front of others because they're they really are engaged and they are really keen in using technologies and learning through games and you know all, all of different theories and, and educational strategies that you can use with technology but i think it's the the going back to the question about accreditation i think it would be key to get that message out that accreditation is for staff 
I think it would be useful for staff just to know and to see that they are growing, they are getting better. And at the end of the day, we all like a, like a little diploma, even if it's a digital one. We all like that, and that, and that will kind of somehow fuel their their like willingness to carry on learning and carry on practicing and using technology within the classroom. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. Uh, and Sarah, I'm conscious. I, I know that your school, particularly um, because I just know the school, is is you know very focused on on accreditation for staff. Yeah. So so we're a Microsoft Showcase School, and and part of us getting to that journey, it was part of the strategic leadership um, timeline of events that's, that that teachers would be encouraged um, and, and through appraisal to take part in the. Um, MEC, the, the Microsoft Education Centre then, um, it's now Microsoft Learn. And um, so all of our staff are MIEs at the moment. And then we've got um, a, a small group who are the experts, the MIE experts. And we're currently um, taking a larger group through who of staff who, who want to then convert to the Microsoft um, Innovative Educator Experts as well. So, so and that has been a four or five year plan. Um, and so, so it's not a rushed process. I think it has to be very strategically thought about. Um, and obviously if you can use the appraisal to do that, we, we, we did do that. Um, but it also, I think part of our conversation was about like kickstarting people who maybe didn't realize those opportunities were there. And it's been excellent to see staff who, who I didn't know had an interest or maybe didn't have an interest um, in this side of things before, but they know where the Microsoft Learn is now. They, they can see the abundance of opportunities on there because it is rich with opportunity. Um, and, and, and teachers, teaching assistants across the school are all accessing things that interest them. So even though we've set like a, a requirement for people to do, um, they are continuing themselves and, and they're, they're self-learning, which I think once you get to that point, that's a really nice thing for, for, for people to see. So Sarah, can I just ask them, because this might be of interest to, to, to colleagues, what's the actual, what, what's the process then? So if, if you were, uh, if schools were looking to become Microsoft showcase schools, what would yeah. be the process for that? So, so initially you would um, become, get on the Microsoft incubator pathway. Um, so, so for that, you'd, you'd have to fill, fulfill a, a requirement, you'd have to have certain amount of your MIEs, your, your MIE experts, which is a, is a lower amount. Um, you then have to showcase that you're looking at the 21st century learning skills and how you're putting it into your long term vision, your long term plan. Um, you then apply, you put a presentation together, and I think as was on Microsoft's way, um, if you're then uh, successful you're then an incubator school for a 12-month period um, you then work with Microsoft you get we get, we get regular um, chances to communicate with them webinars uh, different things which is great uh, keeps us really up to date um, and then if you feel you're ready as a school you can apply to become a Microsoft showcase school which is another application but you know you're, you're just evidencing the, the the skills needed for the 21st century kind of rubric um, that it's in your long-term vision it's happening in your classroom the culture's there um, and then if you're successful it's a very nice celebration for the school <laughs> Uh, thanks for that. And I think that is really useful because colleagues, colleagues that may be interested um, and there'll be a similar process as well for, for, for Google, of course, I, I, you know, clearly there are two aspects to that, aren't there? Because we've been discussing both professional learning communities, but also that that opportunity for schools to be part of that broader community as well. Um, so that opportunity from lear for learning as part of that Microsoft schools showcase schools community i think is is really important um i'm conscious there are some messages coming through the chat as well that that um colleagues uh, are are contributing to and 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 trying to answer um and i noticed that wolfgang has, has replied to to dean there with a quite a, a dean's got quite a challenging question around um programs available to provide energy uh, to rural areas that can benefit from partnering. Um, if 
other colleagues on the call have any experience of that as well it would be very helpful feel free just to contribute to that and and let's create exactly what we're talking about here that professional learning community you know that's 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 why we're here um I'm just going to move us on then because I'm just conscious of time. Um, so I'm going to sort of jump around. Interesting. I'm probably going to, this is probably perhaps linked then to Dean's, Dean's point. So, so what barriers still remain to prevent larger scale education technology adoption? So, you know, what are the barriers? Where, where, where are they still? Uh, we've spoken about professional development. Um, we've spoken about the, the various elements, I think, that make up a, a, a strategy. So, so, so where, where are the barriers still? Who'd like to start us off? Well, maybe, maybe I'll just kick it off real quick. I mean, Dean, on, Dean, uh, Dean, yeah, she's, she's um, it, it pointing out the, the, the probably biggest barrier and uh, Having been um, or working for, or I was working for a United World College in China at the time when the pandemic broke out, and China being being vast as well, you know, you, the, the the distribution of equity to to access is obviously uh, massively different between somewhere like Shanghai and then traveling far far west. Um, and I think that's a very real issue. I mean, maybe not so much in in in, in Europe, but um, but even within Europe, I've got to say, being German myself, Germany, um, despite what maybe many people think, the, the the development of internet and the speed and and accessibility has really not been um, keeping up with times. Um, there's there's multiple. Uh, political leaders who've made this part of their election campaign recently, um, you know, whether it be through th things like digital packs where they make funding available, I think that's probably been the biggest response. Other countries have said, you know, we are blanket um, uh, upgrading internet speeds and, and, and availability. Um, Elon Musk obviously la launched his uh, his satellites to bring internet pretty much to any place in the world, and and so there there are moves being being done. The lack of electricity, Dean, is obviously a, a huge one, and 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 I would say you know as as I said in my answer, solar energy is probably the only thing I can think of in terms of. Um, mobile flexible accessibility but how that then would work with with running you know machines that need charging constantly and so forth um, there are definitely options looking at, at devices you know some some are much better on battery life than others and i think that would be a, a question and, and and also working as you've suggested working with with schools who may have much larger funding so there's international schools that are usually non-for-profit and have a maybe a, a slightly better income and stream um, than, than state schools and, and finding individual schools to potentially partner up with and say look this is something we're really interested in can you help and 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 make this happen um but but the equity bit is is really important right because um even within schools that have the funding that the pandemic didn't look the same to all households and 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 learners uh, thanks Wolfgang. that's that's that is a, a you know a real valid point isn't it you know it uh, it absolutely didn't look the same for everybody. Dean, as well, just, just I'm, I'm, I'll put in the chat, but it's certainly worth looking at the work of uh, Professor John Traxler. Uh, John is a, um, a professor of uh, education technology, uh, very, very close to where I am. So I'm, I'm based here at the University of Wolverhampton, and John is a professor of, uh, of the university. Uh, John has done a significant amount of work um, in rural Africa, actually, um, on connectivity and mobile, one-to-one -one learning programmes, all sorts of things. I'll put a link in the chat just so that you've got access to some of his work, but it's certainly, he's certainly worth someone worth, worth looking at. Um, Anybody else to add to, to add to that? Barriers, Jose? Yeah, I was thinking, I mean, when you, you kind of go back a little bit and have a global vision, like this is, you know, the problem of uh, the, the main thing, which is that you need electricity. When you haven't got that, then then what do you do? So that, that for me would be the, 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 the first thing to, to do and try and look for as what we're going to say, you know, solar panels or, you know, the having the, the professor that you've been uh, talking about linking with other uh, schools around the world. I mean, I mean, we are far apart, but if you contact the right people, I'm quite sure that in education and ed tech, certainly there are many, many people around who are more than willing to 
to give a hand and to help. So, I mean, for me, if you were more like in, in, in Europe, then obviously the electricity might not be that a problem. It might be more to do with the cost and the budget and, and, and where to spend or where to invest first or, or not. So if the, the, the main issue there is electricity, then it's, it's just to look around how to work around that and then move forward. Good luck for, with that anyway. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? Um, I think schools in the UK at the moment, just speaking about those that I've experienced with, are starting to are starting to think about their priorities because for us, energy bills, schools, costs um, are increasing rapidly. So, 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 so head teachers are thinking they've got to find more money in the budget to pay for heating bills uh, and all those costs which are rising rapidly, which maybe they would have thought in their head, oh, I might put a bit of that money aside for something else. So priorities might have just changed slightly with, with, with the ongoing cost rise. Also, um, the pressures that are put on schools um, the way that they're reviewed or the way that they're kind of judged in terms of their, the, the grades that they've got to get the students to and the way that the students are assessed is not always in a way which puts technology into that. Um, so, so it could be seen by some people who are not uh, ed tech inspired um, that, that they'll leave that bit because it doesn't seem as a direct priority for them um, without them thinking about that long term vision of, of preparing the pupils for the greater world and, and, and all of those. They might just be going for that instant um, pressures of, of exams and tests, perhaps. Thanks, Sarah. That's, that's, that moves us very, very nicely on to probably, given the time that we've got, probably the last thing we, we should uh, consider, which is around the, the, the impact then. So what is the true impact of education technology? Uh, and, and I guess by true impact, I'm referring to things that are broader than just those grade outcomes. Um, so how do we measure uh, the true impact of education technologies? Um, and what should those measurements be? Sarah, do you want to keep going? Yeah, yeah, I'll keep going. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think one thing that we, when we were setting out our vision, like seven years ago, we uh, started to, to do this change. We knew kind of that we wanted technology to be the catalyst because our children were de de described as being very passive in their learning um, when they were observed by, by Ofsted, which is you know, uh, kind of like the body of judgment in the UK on schools. Um, so they were described as being learners who were very passive. So, so we wanted to kind of kickstart that and we wanted to really take it on. And we wanted technology to be the driver. Um, so, so for us, we've got very active learners now and technology has played a big part in that. And they, they, they've been collaborating in many different ways. They've been, you know, they, they now um, have further learning opportunities. So, so the classroom, uh, just learning within the classroom is no longer a thing. They are continually able to learn from any point at any place at any time. Um, so so for, for me, it's given the children more opportunities to learn, uh, different styles of learning. Um, I think as also you've got to look at like, I was thinking about this, but, but those small gains for us, parental engagement, because when, when pet, we were using Microsoft OneNote, um, and, we, you know, we continue to use it. We used it before uh, we went into lockdown. Um, but for us, from using that, the parents are getting to see the children's work every night if they wish, because they can do a piece in, in the class. They can go home, they can continue it. And the parents are there having a look at it. Before that, the parents were waiting to see the children's books once a year at a parent's evening when all the comments had already been done, all the, everything had been marked, the children had either moved on or they hadn't. Um, so we found that parental engagement, parental involvement in their own learning has been you know, huge, especially for our SEND learners. We found that the, the, the children who, who've got special educational needs, the parents there really enjoyed having that um, further involvement into the children's learning. So to me, that's a massive gain. I, so. I think if I if I can jump in, Gavin, I think that that's that's such an important point, Sarah, because we too often just write that whole or those multiple generations of parents off in that in that um, ed tech or the technology journey. And I think 
<clears throat> that's that's that can be a true measure of success to build that community that has a similar kind of understanding and appreciation for for what technology does and um and and i would go a step further i mean i think at the same time as as we often have i think written off our parents as being part of that learning journey especially when it comes to technology i think we're kind of doing our students an injustice by continuously calling them digital natives where just because they've grown up during an era where digital means are the norm it doesn't at all give them the skills required to actually necessarily understand what it is that they have in their hands and what they're doing so even though, as you quite rightly said, when you introduced this whole session, Gavin, we've got an overload of, of technology, both in terms of hardware and software, the actual diving into how and what that means um, is, is, is kind of being neglected. And, and that comes back to, we talked about ISTE, we talked about Common Sense Media and, and all these different um, companies or organizations that, that actually try and help with that to try and integrate technology into a curriculum rather to, to, than to segregate it and make it separate so that the skills needed um, are, are there. And I went to a conference about two years ago where, where a, a speaker was presenting that was working and living in Silicon Valley um, and saying that, you know, the reality of, of modern learners of our students are that they're going to probably have somewhere up to 30 to 40 different jobs in the future and something like 10 to 15 careers, which our generations are just not used to. So we've got to find ways with what we have to equip them that they are going to be flexible enough, that they're going to be agile enough, and that they've got an understanding of what it is that they're dealing with um, to, to be able to, to deal with that um, un uncertainty, but maybe also excitement. And, and see it as a positive rather than a negative um, with with what we can give them. And so I think that's where technology can be a genuine um, springboard accelerator and 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 uh, uh, advantageous um, addition. And so that totally moves away from the concept of grades because grades ultimately should just be a measuring a point of of your learning journey in that moment at that moment in time. Um, regardless of when you're, when you're, it's just a feedback me mechanism. But if, if you're using your technology to go beyond the walls of the classroom to look at greater world problems and, and try to figure out ways to, to use that, then that's, I think, your indicator of whether it's successful or not. Thank you, Wolfgang. That's really yeah. good, really interesting. Yeah, Thank I, you, I, Jose. Yeah. yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, going back to something that was mentioned at the very beginning of this uh, webinar uh, about, you know, students know what a, look, a good teacher looks like, and in the same way, they know what uh, different technologies, how, how do they best fit what they want to learn or, what, or how they learn. And I think by, I mean, if any, in any, at any point, any lesson, if you're using some kind of ed tech, at any point, and then having like a short survey, it could be just as easy as a thumbs up or something like that. Then the teacher can have a, a feedback and say, right, this is working or this is not working. So the impact is not being as good as maybe we thought, oh, this is really cool, really cool graphics and this and that. Well, I'm using like, I don't know, 15 iPads, one for each and blah, blah, blah. If at the end of the lesson, we don't have any feedback from the students, then we might be under the impression that, you know, that was really cool because we've used so many different iPads or so many different, you know, uh, software or whatever it is. But the reality is that to, to make an impact and then going back to something that I think was Sarah saying earlier on as well, is the impact into the community as well, the parents' engagement. I mean, every, I think the key here is to, to get the students engaged, but not only engaged in using technology, by engaging the feedback, engaging the process, engaging. In, so by doing that, then you'll know uh, whether it's been successful or not. I mean, on the other hand, you've also got, uh, you know, little applications from, for example, I'm thinking about Teams now from Microsoft. You've got that insight where you can see the levels of engagement and this and some, you know, lots of different statistics, but then you haven't, you, we don't, we can't really afford to forget the, the human side of things and the impact that that's having, because ultimately we if we if go back to the idea of Galaxy, you know, educational leads and referring to the students. So if the way we're using technology is not having a positive impact, it's not how they learn, then what's the point in, in using like a trillion, you know, different things? So, I don't know. <laughs> I, th I think that's a great way to finish, actually, because if it's not having an impact, then what, why are we doing it? What, why are we here? We've, we've, we've sat as a learning community here. We've discussed this. Um, I had one job, which was to keep to time. 
and I failed miserably. And it's a good job I've not been appraised. But can I just thank all of you? Can I thank the panelists for, for, for your contributions? They're really, really valuable. Um, can I ask panelists if you're happy to add your contact details into the, the chat, please, so that people can contact you if, if, if they'd like to. I'm conscious that um, Anton asked a question right at the start, and I know Wolfgang replied to it and said he would be willing to take that offline later. Uh, equally, it would be very good, actually, if, um, if people are attending the EduTech event in Amsterdam, uh, I know some of us certainly will be there. It would be great to meet up at that event um, as well for those people that have been here. And, uh, and just a, a huge thank you. Thank you. We've covered lots of ground. Um, and I think uh, to finish on, on impact was probably the best way to do it. I'll throw back to Edlin. Thank you all. Thank you, Gavin, and thank you so much to our other panelists, Sarah, Wolfgang, as well as Jose, for taking the time to actually um, speak at today's session and share their insights. And uh, as Gavin mentioned, uh, EduTech is coming to Europe this October. It'll be from the 5th to the 6th in Amsterdam. And um, all of you, uh, I do encourage uh, to scan the QR code to actually see what we have in store and, um, you know, get your pass and you can meet some of our speakers there as well uh, this October. So thank you all once again, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Thank you.